Welcome back. Okay, so you know how much I love dynamical systems and I spend a lot of time thinking about how we can use machine learning to model dynamical systems from data. So I thought it'd be useful to give you just kind of a high level overview of some of the things we think about when we're working with dynamical systems, okay? Um, this is just generally good to know and this is just you know a very, very high level kind of topical overview of some of the things you would learn in a dynamical systems class at you know a mile high. So a dynamical system is any system that evolves or changes in time according to some rules. Now that's very, very vague. Uh, if you have an apple falling, right, it is a dynamical system. The position of that apple evolves, it changes in time according to F equals MA, Newton's second law. Uh, a fluid flow is a dynamical system. It evolves according to the Navier-Stokes equations, a pendulum, an automobile, uh, but even very, very, very complicated systems like your brain is a dynamical system. All of the neurons in your brain are connected and there are some set of rules that determine how they fire and interact. We don't know those rules or we don't know all of those rules. We can't write them down in an equation, but they certainly exist and that system certainly evolves in time, okay? So dynamical systems essentially describe the changing world around us from uh, how a disease spreads across a continent to the climate to your brain, uh, and you know, a million other things that are really, really interesting that we want to model, predict, estimate, and control. And increasingly, we're doing this with data. Um, so I'll just tell you some things about dynamical systems that I find interesting. This is by no means a complete list. Okay, so um, in this kind of progression of increasing nonlinearity, uh, and I'll tell you what I mean by nonlinearity in a minute. Kind of the simple dynamical systems are dynamical systems that are linear. Things like a pendulum that has a small angle approximation or a small displacement theta, or a linear spring mass damper system. You just have springs and masses and dampers connected, and you see these systems oscillate. Uh, linear essentially means that if I have two solutions of that dynamical system. I have two, uh, I start from two different initial conditions, you know, theta one and theta two, and I know how those evolve. If I add those two initial conditions together, I just add the solutions, and that's the solution of the new system. So it means that linear superposition holds. If I have two solutions of this system and I add them together, that's also a solution of the system. And that's only true for linear dynamical systems where the dynamics are described by uh, matrix uh, evolution. Now, you can get mildly nonlinear dynamical systems, things like uh, Hamiltonian or Lagrangian dynamics. This duffing oscillator is how a particle would behave in a potential well with two wells, these two kind of bowls here. And if I had a little bead that was rolling around on this wire, its dynamics would be nonlinear. And there would be multiple fixed points uh, given by where the, the bead would be fixed. So at the bottom uh, of these green wells, the bead would be fixed, that's a fixed point. And at the top uh, kind of of this pink part here, that saddle point, if I perfectly balance the bead, it would also stay fixed. So this system has some fixed points and some dynamics, and I'll talk more about that later. And then in kind of the far progression, you have systems that are fully chaotic. Now they, um, are still deterministic. I can still write down a differential equation or some rules that describe how the system evolves in time, but I have some limited forecast ability. If I, uh, if I don't measure my initial state absolutely perfectly, or if I don't know my dynamics to perfect precision, after some amount of time, my prediction is going to diverge from the truth. This is called a sensitive dependence on initial conditions or chaos. Things like the double pendulum or the Lorentz attractor, weather models, turbulent fluids, those all exhibit chaos. And those are kind of uh, special and interesting nonlinear dynamical systems. Okay, good. Uh, and in a previous video, I showed you kind of the anatomy of a dynamical system. You have uh, the time derivative of a state is equal to some you know, function of that state, um, x dot equals f of x. So x is a vector that describes the minimal state you need to describe your system. So in this case, in a pendulum, the minimal state needed to describe that pendulum is not just theta, but theta and theta dot. Because if I'm at a given theta, I could be passing through it this way, 
or passing through it this way. And you need theta and theta dot to uniquely determine your state. So that's what the vector x is. And then the time derivative of that state, the, the way that that state changes in time, is given by f of x, some function of the state. And this might be derived from uh, the Euler-Lagrange equations, or f equals ma, or Hamilton, ha the Hamiltonian equations. Um, but these are essentially the rules for how that state changes in time. And we encode this as a differential equation. Good. Now, oftentimes we want to linearize our system. So I told you that this pendulum uh, behaves linearly near the bottom. If I, if I take this pendulum and I just kick it a little bit, it behaves linearly. But it is nonlinear if I have a large amplitude. If I, if I increase that theta to something you know, close to pi and let it go, I'll get nonlinear effects. So it is a nonlinear dynamical system. What we often do is we look near a fixed point so by fixed point, I mean a, a state x where f of x is equal to 0. So if I have the pendulum in the down position with a 0 velocity, it's not going to move. x dot is equal to 0 in the down position with 0 velocity, when theta and theta dot are 0. That's called a fixed point. There's another fixed point in the pendulum up position, in the theta equals pi, theta dot equals 0. So I have theta equals pi and I start it perfectly still at theta dot equals zero, that's also a fixed point. It's unstable, but it's a fixed point. If I perfectly balance it, it'll stay there. And so this pendulum system has two fixed points where the vector field, where the, the dynamics are equal to zero, and the system would stay put, okay? So what we're going to do with linearization is we're gonna zoom into those fixed points and try to see what the linear dynamics are for small uh, angles around those fixed points. And the way we do it is we say, okay, well, we're zooming into a neighborhood around x bar, our fixed point, and we're going to look at small delta x's in that neighborhood. So x is going to be x bar plus delta x. And we're going to try to build a model for how delta x evolves in time. So uh, ddt of delta x, remember, because x bar is a fixed point, x bar dot is zero. It's just a constant. So the time derivative of delta x is equal to x dot which is f of x, which is f of x bar plus delta x. I think you see where I'm going now. We're going to tailor expand this bit, and we're going to kind of break apart f of x bar and the delta x. And so this, you can tailor expand this, and you get f of x bar, which again, we knew this is a fixed point, so that's equal to 0, plus uh, the Jacobian derivative of this vector f with respect to the vector x evaluated at the fixed point dotted into delta x plus higher order terms, you know, delta x squared, delta x cubed. And remember, we've zoomed in so that we're close to this fixed point x bar, so delta x is small, so these higher order terms are very, very small, and we can kind of neglect these. And so what this means is that we essentially get a dynamical system that is approximately linear for small neighborhoods around these fixed points. So the time derivative of, uh, of my position around that fixed point is equal to this Jacobian derivative. This is just a matrix, okay? Uh, you basically take, so if f is f1, f2, and if x has components x1, x2, then you would take a matrix of partial derivatives, partial f1, partial x1, partial f1, partial x2, partial f2, partial x1, partial f2, partial x2. This is a matrix of derivatives evaluated at x bar. And so at the end of the day, what you get out is a matrix system of ordinary differential equations, an honest-to-goodness linear system x dot equals ax. And that's nice because we know how to handle linear systems. It's very hard to handle these nonlinear systems, but we know a lot about these linear systems. We look at its eigenvalues and its eigenvectors, and we learn if it's stable or unstable. We learn what directions it might be unstable along. Uh, and that can be pretty, pretty useful. So that's kind of why we linearize, is because we know lots about linear systems. And so uh, that's a general strategy when you have a nonlinear system, is to find the fixed points, linearize around the fixed points, and do linear analysis around that system. So uh, this is kind of hopefully a refresher, and I talk about this a lot in my control boot camp. If you have some di differential equation x dot equals ax, this is your linearization, 
then uh, we know how this system X is going to evolve for any future time T. This could be you know, a million years in the future. I just take the matrix exponential of E to the AT times my initial condition. So I can take any initial condition and advance it as far as I want, forward or backward in time, just by multiplying the, by this matrix exponential E to the AT. And that's easy to compute in modern computers. Uh, it's also useful to have linear systems because you can essentially use the eigenvectors of A to define a new coordinate system that diagonalizes your, di your dynamics. So if T are eigenvectors of my A matrix, uh, and I define a new coordinate system so that uh, Z is essentially in that eigenvector coordinate system, then I can write down what the Z dot dynamics are, and you'll have to kind of write this down slowly and convince yourself that this is true, uh, but if I have you know, x dot equals t z dot, then z dot equals t inverse x dot, and x dot is ax, so z dot equals t inverse ax, and x equals t z, so z dot equals t inverse a t z. Now this might seem like I made things worse. It definitely looks like I made things worse, but if this t coordinate system are very specially chosen to be eigenvectors of a, then this matrix here actually becomes a diagonal matrix. Okay, so uh, T inverse A T is a diagonal matrix if T are the eigenvectors of A. And so what this allows me to do is if I have a linear system and I find the eigenvectors of A, I get a new coordinate system where my dynamics are decoupled and linear. Very, very useful. So that means that Z1 dot only depends on Z1 and Z2 dot only depends on Z2, and so on and so forth. It's a decoupled system. It's very easy to simulate and predict and understand. Good. Uh, and this is kind of the eigenvalue equation that you would use uh, to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of that A matrix. Uh, and there's an interpretation that I absolutely love, and I'm going to tell you because I think it's super cool, is that if I take this, uh, this expression here for x of t equals e to the a t x naught, and I expand out this e to the a t here in eigenvector coordinates, I, I get something very simple. I get this t e to the lambda t uh, big T inverse times x naught. And again, this doesn't look simple, but I'm going to explain why it is. So what this means is that I can take any initial condition x naught, and I can get that, I can flow that system forward in time and tell you what it, where it will be after time t using this expression. So I want to walk you through what this means physically. So the first part here, x naught times big T inverse, what that does is it takes my initial condition, x at time zero, and it maps me into my eigenvector coordinate system, z at time zero. Now, in that eigenvector coordinate system, it's really easy to advance the system because the dynamics are diagonal. I just advance z1, z2, and, you know, and all the way to zn independently because it's diagonal. And so it's easy to advance z naught time t forward by multiplying by this diagonal exponential matrix. This is just a, a, an exponential, a diagonal matrix of exponentials. But now we're still in eigenvector coordinates, so we want to map back into our original coordinate system by multiplication with t. So I think that's just a really cool interpretation of eigenvalues and eigenvectors for linear dynamical systems, is that if I have an initial condition, I can map into eigenvector coordinates with t inverse. There, in these eigenvector coordinates, it's easy to advance the dynamics forward in time because the system is decoupled and diagonal. That's this e to the lambda t. And then after I've advanced my system in eigenvector coordinates, I finally map out back to my original physical space uh, by matrix multiplication with big T. Okay, good. So uh, let's take a step back. We're talking about dynamical systems. Even nonlinear systems often have fixed points, and we can linearize around those fixed points. And looking at the eigenvalues and eigenvectors can be very useful. It gives us a local coordinate system. It tells us if I have a unstable eigenvalue, then that corresponding eigenvector is the direction in which the system is going to blow up. So it tells you kind of how the system evolves locally uh, in time around those fixed points. Good. Uh, okay, so let's look at a more complicated system. Remember that middle uh, system I showed you with the three fixed points? That's this duffing equation. X dot equals velocity, so the time derivative of position equals velocity. The time derivative of velocity equals X minus X cubed. Uh, 
This is a very simple differential equation for the motion of a particle in a double potential well. And you know you can kind of verify for yourself that this system has three fixed points. So for there to be a fixed point where the right hand side is zero, v has to equal zero, and then x minus x cubed has to equal zero. And that's only true if x is equal to zero or plus or minus one. So these are the three fixed points of the system. And you can essentially linearize this nonlinear differential equation about any one of these three fixed points. So, uh, and again, this is what the, what the actual physics looks like. This is the phase portrait of this dynamical system where you have this potential here, which uh, is essentially given by uh, x to the fourth minus x squared. And what you have here on these axes down here, this is the x-axis and this is the v-axis. And if I have a point and I start here, my, my particle starts here and I'm rolling around this potential well, I can visualize that in this phase portrait as going around in a circle here. So if I start at this position with uh, zero velocity and you know, some position x, what's going to happen is I'm going to roll down the hill and my velocity is going to increase to a maximum here. Then I'm going to roll up the hill and my velocity is going to decrease. I'm going to turn around and my velocity is going to increase in the negative direction. It'll peak here and then I'll go back up here. That's exactly what this phase portrait is saying. You know, I start at this position x with zero velocity. I accelerate until a maximum velocity here at the bottom of the well. Then I decelerate until I'm at the top of the other side. Then I accelerate back around in the negative direction and so on and so forth. And with no friction, you just go around and around and around. So it's a very physical picture that shows you kind of pictorially what the dynamics are going to be. And they're given by this differential equation. So what you do is when you write down your differential equation or you discover this with some machine learning model, you try to find the fixed points. Again, here there are three fixed points, uh, the bottom of each of the two wells, and then also at the saddle point, where if I was perfectly aligned, I would stay there forever. Uh, yeah, and I think I told you that this is essentially, you can derive this from Newton's second law, F equals MA, where you have uh, a potential field and the potential is given by X to the fourth minus X squared. Um, like this is literally what would happen if you had a roller coaster that was shaped like this with no friction and you were kind of on that track moving around, okay? Good, so if we want to zoom into one of these fixed points, one of these three fixed points, and we want to know what the dynamics will locally do near that fixed point, we compute this uh, Jacobian of partial derivatives. That's what I told you before, is essentially the first term is partial of this equation with respect to x, that's zero. The partial of this equation with respect to v is one. The partial of this equation with respect to x is one minus three x squared. And the partial of this equation with respect to v is zero. If there was friction, there would be a, a term down here because this would have a v term. And so you can evaluate this uh, Jacobian, this matrix of partial derivatives at any of these three fixed points. You just plug in these fixed points to this x uh, bar squared here. And essentially uh, what you would find is that the eigenvalues of these two green fixed points are neutrally stable. The eigenvalues of this A matrix would be plus and minus I omega meaning that the system just oscillates forever. And the eigenvalues of this fixed point here are going to be a saddle point. They're going to be plus or minus one. And that means that one of those directions is unstable. If I take this uh, roller coaster, I put my roller coaster right here, or the car, and I push it a tiny bit to the left or the right, or I give it a tiny bit of velocity, it will unstably move away from that fixed point. And you can learn that by looking at these linearizations. Okay, good. Uh, and the eigenvalues tell you if it's stable or unstable. The corresponding eigenvector tells you along what directions the system is unstable. So actually these red curves here, these kind of 45 degree angle curves, those are the eigenvectors uh, of, of that fixed point. And you can verify it yourself. Compute the eigenvalues of this, uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this linearization uh, for the saddle point, for the zero, zero fixed point. And you'll find that the two eigenvectors are kind of 45 degree uh, angles, like this picture here. Uh, and so if you take those eigenvectors, those linear subspaces, and you continue them, you sweep out stable and unstable manifolds for the system.
And so uh, here's another case I really like where it's a nonlinear differential equation with a single fixed point at the origin. And if you locally linearized, you would find that this system is a saddle point. One of the directions is stable, the y direction is stable, and the x direction is unstable. And so if I start with an initial condition here, I'm going to move towards the fixed point in the y direction and then away from it in the x direction. Uh, and so you can then take those eigenvectors and continue them and learn that there is a stable manifold and an unstable manifold. And this is very, very useful in dynamical systems. Uh, and you, know, you can have more and more complicated kind of versions of this uh, where these saddle points tend to uh, amplify uncertainty. So this is kind of one of the, the ways you can almost think about chaos is um, amplifying uncertainty. So if I had these kind of balls of uncertainty and I advance them forward in time, they're going to end up kind of squashing along this, uh, this unstable manifold along the direction of the stable manifold. So things get stretched and folded in these systems. Good, um, another really, really important part of dynamical systems are bifurcations. So oftentimes uh, you have a, a differential equation uh, that has some parameter that you can vary. So in, in fluid flows, often it's the velocity of the incoming flow or the size of the object in the, you know, the wing in your, in your wind tunnel. Um, there's all kinds of bifurcations in dynamical systems. If you're looking at um, the spread of a disease like COVID-19, uh, the bifurcation parameter might be, uh, you know, the infection rate or something like that. And so this parameter mu, you often want to know how your dynamical system is going to change as I change a parameter of the system. So there's the state of the system x and there's the parameter of the system mu. Uh, and this is kind of a neat one, x dot equals mu x minus x cubed. So if mu is negative, you have a stable system and everything just contracts to x equals zero. But if mu is positive, you have something that's linearly unstable and it's gonna grow exponentially until it gets large enough to get counteracted by this uh, saturating, this stabilizing cubic term. Um, and so you can write it like this as x times mu minus x squared. So again, if mu is positive, my system exponentially grows until it's balanced uh, by that term. And so you can draw these bifurcation diagrams. So on the x-axis here, is the, this is the mu axis. And what we're showing here, these are the dynamics in x uh, for a fixed mu value. So uh, mu zero is right here. And so for negative mu, all of my x dynamics, no matter where I start in x, I go to the origin, it's stable dynamics. But when mu is positive, let's say for this value here, positive mu, what will happen if I start anywhere near the origin is I'll actually grow exponentially until I hit this uh, mu equals x squared parabola, until x squared equals mu, and then it balances that term out, okay? And again, you can look at the local linearization by computing this Jacobian, uh, and you can see if it's stable or unstable, uh, and you get this additional branch of stable points for positive mu, okay? so. So essentially now for positive mu, I have a set of solutions or fixed points at uh, x equals plus or minus square root of mu. That's what we have in this kind of parabola here. And you can look at the stability of the, the kind of new fixed points or uh, the original x equals zero fixed point. Uh, another one in kind of higher dimensions is this hop bifurcation. This comes up all the time in instabilities of physical systems like fluids. Uh, where again, you have a, a minimal state x and y, you have some linear dynamics here, and if mu is negative, the system is linearly stable. If mu becomes positive, as you, as you pass through the mu equals zero point, it becomes unstable, and a new kind of branch of solutions, this new uh, limit cycle uh, behavior emerges, where the system actually wants to be on this fixed amplitude limit cycle that balances out this uh, cubic term. Okay, and again, you can write this in polar coordinates and get a really, really simple representation uh, that's directly analogous to this pitchfork bifurcation.
Now, I want to point out that this is like an entire graduate level course looking at all the bifurcations and all of the ways to analyze these dynamical systems and to transform them and solve them and analyze them. I'm showing you a cartoon of the kinds of things that can happen and the kinds of things we care about in dynamical systems. This is just a, a tiny glimpse into this, into this world. But we know that systems do bifurcate. They do change like dramatically and qualitatively sometimes when I just tiny, you know, tiny changes in my parameter can sometimes cause kind of big, big changes in my system. That's what bifurcations are. Uh, you can also have dynamics in discrete time. So what I was showing you earlier are continuous dynamics. The time derivative of the state equals some, uh, some function. That's a continuous differential equation. You can also have discrete time dynamical systems like this uh, logistic map here, which describes population dynamics. So the way you would think about this, maybe X is the population of bunnies at year K. And so if I have you know, 10 bunnies or whatever, some number of bunnies at year K, I can compute this right hand side and it tells me how many bunnies I have the next year. And then I plug that in here and it tells me how many bunnies I have two years later. And I plug that in three years later. And you can step this forward year to year to year. That's why it's called discrete time because it steps forward in time in discrete chunks. Uh, and these systems also have bifurcations and rich chaotic behavior. So for example, this mu here uh, is somehow like a reproduction rate uh, for those bunnies. And as I sweep through different values of mu, I can get very, very different uh, behavior of those bunny populations in time. So for you know 3.45 value of mu, my bunny population might pop back and forth between four or five or six or seven fixed points in a very predictable way. It might just kind of reproducibly go, you know, back and forth between the same population dynamics. As I increase mu, the bunny population from year to year might bounce around between all of these kind of fractal points. And that's a, a discrete time kind of analog of chaos, okay? This is one of my favorite diagrams, this logistic map. Okay. Uh, and you can get discrete time dynamics from a continuous time system like this. So if I have a differential equation, x dot equals f of x, maybe this is Newton's law or a fluid flow equation or whatever, but I have some continuous system from physics, I might want to integrate that dynamical system numerically on a computer. I might want to take an initial condition and be able to step it forward in time discreetly in a computer. And so the way we would do that is essentially uh, through this flow map operator, f of t, which takes my initial condition uh, x at time t naught, and it maps it forward to x at t naught plus t. It maps it forward in time by t. And essentially, you do that by integrating this vector field, this f of, uh, f of t. You integrate the particle along that vector field. And as that particle moves along f, it experiences a different f because f is a function of space. So that's why I have this uh, dependent variable tau here. And what that does is that essentially establishes a discrete time update like I showed you earlier, like that logistic map, where now if I know my system at time step k, I can get my system at time step k plus one. And if I know it at k plus one, I can get it at k plus two. And this essentially forms a computer program or uh, yeah, like a program that will step my system forward in discrete time intervals. And that can be really useful uh, when I simulate fluid flows. For example, you know, I might want to drop a bunch of particles and see how those particles advect along with that fluid flow. So in this case, F would be the fluid flow field, X would be the particle, and I'd want to integrate those particles through the flow field. In that case, F would also be a function of time because you can tell that my flow is changing in time. And I can do lots of things like get the finite time Lyapunov exponents. I'll have a whole video talking about these FTLE fields and how we use those to understand fluids. Uh, and those give us the time varying analogs of those stable and unstable manifolds I told you about earlier. Uh, and those can be very, very useful. Integrating particles through the flow can be really, really useful for understanding things like how mixing occurs in my dynamical system. If I have a flow field like, you know, this is a, a plate that's moving up and down in a fluid, and I might want to understand how fluid is entrained or mixed. Maybe I drop uh, a buoy in the ocean or I drop some uh, tracer particles. I want to know how those are going to mix throughout the ocean. I'd have to integrate those through that dynamical system. Uh, and that gets us to chaos, which again, I mentioned this a little bit, 
uh, chaotic systems have this uh, mixing effect that even if I have a very tight packet of initial conditions, so I'll, this movie will play again, my initial conditions start in a very tight cube where maybe I have a little bit of uncertainty in where I started, and very, very rapidly, if I integrate those initial conditions through this chaotic dynamical system, this Lorentz system, uh, they stay together for a little while, but after not too long, they start to stretch, and eventually they're going to stretch and fold and mix along this entire attractor. And so uh, that idea of mixing is really key to chaos, or a sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Even if I have a pretty tight distribution of initial conditions, after some finite amount of time, I really can't tell you know, where I'm going to be because they eventually mix along this attractor. So I'm gonna have a whole uh, video on chaotic dynamical systems and how we analyze them statistically, uh, what chaos means, examples of chaotic systems, but here I just wanted to give you kind of this teaser to show you that chaotic systems have this sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Um, they tend to mix in a finite time. There is a finite time kind of prediction horizon of where things will go. Uh, and after that, you can only describe them in a statistical sense. Lots of systems we care about are chaotic. Uh, local weather patterns are chaotic. You know, we don't know where a hurricane's gonna go because it's a chaotic dynamical system. Fluid flows in general, turbulence is chaotic. Uh, and this is one of my favorite uh, classes of dynamical systems. Okay, this was a mile high overview of things I care about in dynamical systems. Each one of these vignettes, you know, is at least a couple of lectures in a big dynamical systems class. So this is not, you know, uh, this is just the beginning of, uh, of dynamical systems. But I wanted you to know the kinds of things I think about. For example, when I use machine learning to discover dynamical systems, I care about things like where are the fixed points? What are the local linearizations look like? Do they have the right stability? Do I get the same statistical mixing in my machine learning models and in my data? Things like that really matter. All right, thank you.